In today's video, I am going to plan out my Zenith 750 Super Duty build. And I'm going to do that by pointing out some of the things on my Zenith Cruiser that I'm going to do the same on the Super Duty and some of the things that I will do different the second time around. Now hopefully this video will be entertaining for you, but also maybe useful if you are maybe just getting started building a cruiser or a stole or a Super Duty, or maybe any other airplane for that matter, because I'm kind of taking all the lessons I've learned building this airplane and applying those to my Super Duty. Now it's also important, I think, if you're going to build an airplane, to figure out exactly how you want to use that airplane. In my case for the Super Duty, I plan on building that airplane as an all-out backcountry bush plane. And that's going to affect some of the things that I do to the airplane, which I will talk about as we go through this airplane. Now, a lot of you guys have been asking me which engine am I going to install in the Super Duty. I haven't done a ton of research on it yet, but I have started thinking about it. And so far, my thoughts are between two engines, the Viking 185 and a Lycoming uh, type engine, say like a, a Titan 205 horsepower, which is what the factory Super Duty has. Now I think each of those engines has advantages and disadvantages. One of the disadvantages I think of, of any of the modern engines, even the UL power behind me, is that they are absolutely dependent on battery power and um, fuel pumps. So if any one of those goes, and usually you have backups, but if any one of those goes, the engine quits and it's dead. Whereas like a Lycoming, if you've just got magnetos, as long as you're getting fuel to that engine, it's pretty much going to run. The other thing I've been thinking about is, remember I said I am building this airplane as an all-out backcountry airplane where I can fly out west and camp on a mountaintop for three or four days or a riverbed and go fishing for a few days or things like that. And during that time, if I'm out there, what if my airplane battery dies? What if I'm charging my cell phone or a GPS or some other device or something, or even an air pump for my tires if the tires get low? Well, if you kill your airplane battery, then you're kind of stuck. But with a Lycoming type engine, if you kill your battery, you always have the option to hand prop it, which I think would be handy if I'm by myself out in the middle of a mountain somewhere uh, with no help available. So, those are my thoughts so far. Like I said, I'm not 100% sure what I'm gonna do yet. I'm really leaning towards probably the 205 horsepower Titan that uh, the factory has in their Super Duty. But as time goes on and I get further into the build, we'll iron those issues out, I guess. Now, something else I'd like to add to the Super Duty that I did not do on this airplane, I kind of wish I did, is I want to add on the cowling here an external plug-in to plug in a battery charger. Because there may be some times where, especially like in the winter, I may not fly for a month or something like that. And I, it, instead of taking the cowling off to plug in my battery charger, it might be nice just to be able to flip open a hatch or something and plug the battery charger right into the side of the airplane. That's something I may actually add to this airplane at some point. Now, a lot of you guys that are watching this have probably followed along on the build videos I did for my cruiser. And you know about the tons and tons and tons of extra work that I did to make a bunch of fairings for the airplane. For example, this fairing that goes along the bottom of the front windshield, it looks great on the airplane, I like the looks, but I think there is no advantage to this fairing over the rubber trim that's supplied with the Zenith kit. So do I wanna take the time to make another fairing like this? I actually don't know yet, and I probably won't know until I get into the project. I'd really like to say that I really wanna keep this airplane simple uh, and just make it a Jeep, you know, a Sky Jeep. But my problem that I have is when I start getting into a build and things like that, my uh, perfectionist attitude kind of comes into play and I start wanting to make things absolutely as perfect and as beautiful as I possibly can, which means that I'd wanna make a new fairing for the Super Duty also. But I don't know. Uh, I don't want to make another fairing, but I may. Now, I also made these fairings for the wings here on the cruiser, but the good thing about the Super Duty is right here where these skins meet, where they don't meet up too well, and that's why I made the fairings for the cruiser, 
there's a, um, a slat bracket that comes out of here. So these two skins on a Super Duty never really meet anyway, so there's no reason to really have a fairing here, which is good news because that saves me from making these fairings again. By far, the most time-consuming fairing that I've made is this one here on the tail of the cruiser. It wraps around the, the vertical stabilizer and then the horizontal stabilizer. The Super Duty is built a little bit differently than the cruiser. The whole tail section actually is different. So I don't know that there's a need for a fairing back here. If there is, this is one that I will definitely redo on the Super Duty if I can clean it up a little bit. Um, I know, uh, is it Mark Patey or Mike Patey? One of the Pateys that had the Zenith 801, they did a lot of fairing work back here and he said it really made a big difference in the performance of the airplane because it was a lot less drag. So I do plan on, on the back of the airplane, I'll make whatever fairings I think are necessary to clean that area up. Now there's a lot of things I want to talk about inside the airplane, so let's dive in. All right, now the first thing inside the airplane is the carpet. Now I have carpet all the way from the top of the back wall down. The carpet goes under the seats here and down and then here and it stops up here where the, uh, where the heel of your feet would be. In the Super Duty, now the Super Duty is a little bit different because there's a seat right here, there's a third seat in the back. But I don't plan on having any carpet from here, from the back, all the way up to here. None of this carpet will be in the airplane, it'll just all be painted. Now these carpets here, these are really nice carpets from Flightline Interiors. In fact, they made my, my seat, the control stick boot, everything on the interiors from Flightline Interiors. So I do like having the carpet here, it just keeps you know probably the paint nice. And these pull out pretty easy, if these ever get worn or damaged, they can just take them out and buy new ones. So I'll have the carpet up front, but like I said, nothing going aft. Now one of the things I like about my cruiser that I did, I like where I mounted my headset jacks because they're behind the seats, which means when you're sitting in the airplane, if, if the jacks were on the panel, you know, you'd have your headset wires on your lap and they'd just be in the way. Well back here, they're out of the way and although I really haven't car carried any cargo back here yet, uh, they're just not in the way of anything. But again, as I plan out the Super Duty, I know the Super Duty is a little bit different because like I said, there's a seat back here. In fact, I don't even think they have this center section part here. So uh, I may not be able to mount them right here, but I do like having the headset jacks behind the seats. All right, I have crawled in the airplane for this. And well, let me get the panel on for you, I guess. But there's a few things I want to mention about the instrument panel. And the first thing is the instrument panel itself. The, the Super Duty is available with three different panels. You can have the cruiser panel, which is what you're looking at here. You can have the 750 Stoll panel, which I believe is the current, or um, not current, but the, uh, the, the panel that comes with the Super Duty. And then of course you have the unpanel option. I like the cruiser panel because there's a lot of real estate to put a lot of instruments up here. But what I do like about the, the stole panel is that in the corners here, you have a lot better visibility outside the airplane. And as a bush plane flying in the mountains and landing on short fields and stuff, I think that extra visibility would come in handy. So I will plan on using the standard stole panel. Now while we're talking about the panel and, and all the real estate available for instruments, you know, you can see I have a Dynon HDX, the Dynon radio, the intercom, and I have a, an iPad mount here. But one of the things I noticed from flying this airplane is that I never really use the iPad. Uh, everything I need is on the Dynon. So this actually is kind of a waste. And in the Super Duty, I will not have a mount for the iPad. I'll just have the Dynon if I go with the Dynon, which we'll talk about in just a second. But I'll have the EFIS screen and with this Dynon, you can get the VFR sectional charts on the screen. Um, so that's what, I would, that's what I would do. I would just have one screen on the Super Duty and then of course the radio and transponder and all that kind of stuff. Now I'm not sure exactly how the stole panel is, but one of the things I don't like about the cruiser panel is it's, it's very thin aluminum. 
and my throttle it's just uh, you know you can see you can move it because you're just bending the aluminum where it mounts uh, what I should have done was was it reinforced the panel where the throttle goes but that's something I'll do on the Super Duty panel. I mean, this doesn't affect anything, but I just don't like it. I'd rather it be nice and solid. So for the Super Duty panel, wherever the throttle comes out, I'll reinforce that just to make sure it's, it's pretty stiff. Now, I talked about on a, a, an older video, the way I have my throttle and trim and flaps, I have it all set up here so that when I'm flying, you know, I don't have to take my hand off the throttle. I can kind of work the flaps and the trim uh, just with one hand. However, what I noticed is I would very much prefer to have the trim on the stick. So for the Super Duty, it'll have the same Y stick, but you can get uh, uh, grips for the, st the stick here that have the push to talk, but also the, the elevator trim. So that's something on the Super Duty. I will move the elevator trim switch from uh, the panel to the control stick. Now one of the other things I'm going to do different too is my flap lever here. This is really nice. This is from Aircraft Specialty. It's a nice big flap switch and I really like it. Uh, I will use this again. I'll buy another one from Aircraft Specialty to put in the Super Duty. But the one of the things I always find myself doing in flight is going like this. I'm always just making sure my flaps are up and it's weird because I know they're up but it's just there's no indication anywhere of the flap position and it's super easy to have an indicator you just put a little potentiometer on the you know anywhere on the flaps or the flap motor and then the Dynon will actually display your flap position so instead of always just doing this just to verify that the flaps are up it'd be nice to have an indicator right on the screen that tells me the position of the flaps. So that is something I will add to the Super Duty. Now one of the other things I want to talk about with the panel, and it doesn't matter which panel you get, the Cruiser or the Super Duty or the Stoll panel or whatever, but one of the things, this is just one panel that I cut holes in and mounted the instruments. And it works great, but if I ever want to update anything, it's going to be difficult to do because if I have to change the panel, well, we have all these rivets here that rivet the panel in. So I'd have to remove the windshield, drill out all these rivets, and then put a new panel in here and cut it out for whatever new instruments I'd want to put in. So I think a smart way to go, and I know a lot of people are already doing this, is on the new panel, I will cut out the, the entire panel except I'll leave like a one inch lip all the way around it and then of course what you do is you get other you make a flat piece of aluminum you put it on there and you know cut it to shape cut your holes out and you basically just screw that aluminum to the one inch lip that's around the panel so what that means for the future is if I ever want to change anything will you just unscrew that that face plate and you can cut out a new one and put a new one on and change it however you want so I think that's a real smart way to go, and that's definitely something I'll do on the Super Duty. Now, Zenith also has the, this is what they call the center console option, and I don't even know why they make it option. They should just make it standard because I think pretty much everybody installs the center console. And I really like this because it's just a great place for all your switches. I have my fuel selector, and then I have my... Uh, my beacon, nav, strobe, and then recognition lights here, my master switch, and then avionics master. Um, so I like it. I'll, I'll definitely get the uh, center console option for the Super Duty and do the same thing. I'll mount all my switches here. One of the other things I did on my cruiser, which I don't really like, is underneath the panel here, I have a couple fuse blocks with fuses. So most of those things like lights and stuff like that are on fuses. And I do have some circuit breakers for the really important stuff that if they went out in flight, you know, I may want to try to reset. But the, um, the fuses, even though I haven't had to change any, I think they're a little bit more of a hassle than I thought being under the panel here. So for the Super Duty, I will have all circuit breakers and no fuses. So that comes to, well, what will I put in the panel? I currently have a Dynon HDX and you know everything I have is Dynon, the transponder, radio, intercom, everything. It really, really works well. It's an easy system to install. Everything just plugs into each other. It's a great system. I love this screen. It's super sharp. 
Uh, even my iPad, when I fly during the day, it's kind of hard to see, even at full brightness. But with the Dynon, even with the sun shining on it, it's super easy to see, even in the middle of the afternoon. The other thing I really, really like about the, uh, the HDX is, if you can see, the bottom of the screen is angled out. It's not just a, a flat panel. And this is just really nice. I just, when I'm pressing buttons, it, it's almost easier it, it to push down than it is to push in. I don't know, it's just something little, but I really like that. So I really like the operation of the Dynon. I will probably go with Dynon again for the Super Duty. Now, one of the things I will do differently though, because Remember, the Super Duty is a fairly slow airplane, and I do, maybe once or twice a year, I do want to fly it out west, which means a lot of flying. Even to get up to northern Michigan here, where I currently, well, I currently live in southern Michigan, but if I wanted to go up to northern Michigan for some bush flying, or landing on like Fox Island, or uh, things like that, you know, it's a couple hour flight. So, with the Dynon, all I have to do is buy two servos, and I can have a full autopilot. So I do plan on installing an autopilot in uh, my next airplane. Also with the Dynon, I want to make the airplane IFR capable because if I am flying out west, I don't want to get trapped or, or stuck for a day or two if there's you know a thin thousand foot overcast layer that maybe I can just bust up through and continue on my way. So I do want to make it IFR, but as far as I know, I think I don't think Dynon has an IFR certified GPS, so I might have to get like the Garmin, I think it's the 175 is their new one, or maybe it's a 375, I can't remember, but it's an IFR GPS where you can do LPV approaches with it. So uh, something I have to talk to Dynon about. And if I'm going to make it IFR, then I'm going to probably want to use Dynon's pitot tube because it's a heated pitot tube and it also, again for bush flying, has angle of attack capability with it. So Dynon pitot tube along with the Dynon, uh, the full Dynon panel. And what's really cool is like you can see these little little modules here for the radio and intercom. They also make, there's two more you can get. One of them is for, you can put on like this side. One is a, the autopilot controller and then I think the other one just, uh, it might just do things like set the, the barometer and things like that. but. Uh, it makes it real, real nice and easy, I think, to control the autopilot with the Dynon. I need to end the video here because I did film the rest of the video, but this entire video is about 25 minutes long uh, as I edit it together on my computer. And I don't want to put out a video that long because even I don't like to watch 25 minute long videos. So this will be a two part series. That's it for part one. I've got a lot more to show you uh, in the next video. That'll be out in a few days. So thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Give it a like, a thumbs up, whatever. It just helps me out. And really, guys, come on. It takes you like a second to do. So, all right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you again on part two.